Seven years of updates, seven years. That is what Google is promising on their new Pixel 8 and Pixel 8 Pro series. And I don't mean security, I'm talking feature drops and full OS updates and security. But I mean, come on, a promise from Google? That's kind of like your cat promising to not eat your plants and pee on your stuff. In the last six months alone, Google has killed 11 products and services, including YouTube Stories, their podcasts app, Google Domains, and Jamboard. And there's even been broken promises in Pixel's past. And again, the rest of Made by Google 2023 sounded kind of awesome too. Like a high-powered Google Assistant? Oh, I really want to believe them here. So, all right, gosh darn it. I'm giving them another chance. Let's talk about everything they're planning and hope that they've matured enough to follow through on the plans. Like I'm gonna follow through on my plan for this segue to our sponsor, Hetzner. Hetzner's newest high-performance cloud servers now have dedicated vCPUs, which makes their performance graph look like this. It's going up. So check them out at the link below and use code LTT23 for 20 euros off. The big announcements are, naturally, the Pixel 8 and the Pixel 8 Pro. This is the third iteration of the big camera bar design that Google introduced on the Pixel 6 series, and it is, well, it's still polarizing, but hey, it's what's on the inside that counts, right? And Google has packed it in this year. Their new 120 hertz Actua displays are brighter than ever. They can do 30 watt fast charging now, and the 50 megapixel wide angle main shooter gets a new sensor and 10 bit HDR photo capabilities. Both phones are IP68 water resistant, making them great candidates for people who get wet sometimes, though there are other options. And both get an upfront promise of seven years of OS security and feature drop updates. Also, unlike Apple's new lineup, both pro and non-pro users get Google's new Tensor G3 chipset. Of course, latest doesn't necessarily mean greatest, and Google's Tensor family of semi-custom chips from Samsung have been a source of frustration for Pixel users due to their lackluster performance compared to Apple and their sometimes thermal issues. This time around, they're using Samsung's four nanometer process with four little cores, four medium ones, and then a single high-performance Cortex-X3. Unlike the G2, whose main claim to fame was better AI, the G3 looks like it will have significantly more performance on tap for CPU-intensive tasks, games, and, okay, well, if Google's focus during the event was anything to go by, mostly still AI. But that's not a terrible thing necessarily. In fact, one of the highlights of the event was the improved audio cleanup features. Clear calling background noise removal is better than ever with updated training models. It's gonna be ready to come out and join everybody for dinner. So are you still thinking of trying that place on 63rd? And Audio Magic Eraser is a new video editing feature that removes unwanted background noise from, say, that clip of you showing off your Funko Pop collection with the uncomfortable breathing noises. The demo really was impressive. <laughs> but it was also pre-recorded and obviously designed to show it in the best possible light. But according to Google, this new chip will enable all kinds of new on-device machine learning capabilities thanks to its support for more concurrent AI tasks and its support for learning models that are 10 times the complexity of the Pixel 6. I do have to say that Google's lack of focus on the new chipsets, CPU and GPU performance does make me wonder if the on paper improvements we talked about before will translate to the real world, but maybe our upcoming short circuit unboxing and first impressions will give you a better idea of what to expect. Head on over there and subscribe if you haven't already. For now, I guess we'll talk about AI some more. Best take looks kind of awesome to be honest. In the past, you could take a burst of pictures and Google would recommend the best one out of the lot, but that was then, and this is now. Now you can mix and match the best faces for each individual, creating a new best shot where your aunt who always blinks and your ADHD nephew both look their best, however unrealistic that might be. They also spoke of improved real tone that allows for better color grading on different skin tones except for that last guy they showed whose forehead and eyes kind of completely disappeared. Points for improvement and honesty, I guess, Google, but it's clear that there is still work to do. 
Um, you can pinch and embiggen the main focus of your photos now, kind of like selecting a sticker from an image on iOS. Oh, and there's Video Boost, which will allow you to upload your videos to Google's data center, where they can be processed for improved HDR and for Night Sight. If Video Night Sight is anywhere near as good as Google's already stellar Night Sight for photos, then I'm very excited for its launch later this year. Or at least I would be if I ponied up the extra $300 for the Pixel 8 Pro, because Video Boost isn't coming to non-pro users, at least not now. And what's never coming is the better camera system. With matching 50 megapixel main shooters, neither the 8 nor the 8 Pro are gonna look bad, but the Pro gets an additional 48 megapixel, 125 and a half degree ultra wide camera and a 48 megapixel 5X telephoto camera, both with optical image stabilization and quad pixel phase detection, which has benefits like faster, more accurate autofocus and improved low light performance. And not only will it take better pictures, but the 8 Pro might display your pictures better as well. It's Super Actua display is not only larger, it is denser, brighter, and has a wider variable refresh rate range thanks to its LTPO OLED display. In real world terms, this tech should offer both power savings and improvements to peak brightness with the 8 Pro hitting a claimed 2400 nits. And ironically, we have Apple to thank for it. So uh, good job on LTPO, Apple. The larger size of the Pro variant also allows for a larger battery, though Google claims that both models will deliver an identical experience for battery life. And then finally, in what was far and away the biggest curveball that we saw today, the Pro also has a temperature sensor? You know what? I love it. I don't have any idea what I'd use it for yet. But to make sure that the milk in your baby's bottle is just the right temperature. But in a world where phones keep losing nifty features like headphone jacks and IR blasters, I think this is a great addition, even if it'll probably go away in the next Pixel because, you know, Google things. Moving on from the new Pixels, let's talk about the version of Android that'll run on them. It's Android 13. Wait, no, sorry, it's 14, but my goodness, does it ever look a lot like 13? Uh, okay, well, there's customizable lock screens. Woo, um, new clocks and widgets. And we also get the ability to make shortcuts to specific apps and controls. I mean, to be clear, these are all nice things. It's just that they aren't exactly exciting, especially when you consider that some of these features have been present on competing Android devices for time. Uh, you can create custom wallpapers using text to image generative AI though, which is not nearly as interesting as the amazing looks you can create using lttstore.com. How about the plaid flannel for fall, huh? Um, oh, back to Pixel. Oh, wait, no, there's something. Uh, there's improvements to accessibility. These are always welcome. And this time they come in the form of way larger font sizes and non-linear scaling that will prevent titles and headers from taking up the entirety of your screen. This is actually really great news for whenever I need to help my mother-in-law with her phone because she always turns the text size to maximum. I'm just like, how do you even use this thing? It's all taken up by the header. Also, those who are hard of hearing will have an easier time setting up and routing audio from their phone to their hearing aid and using flash notifications to grab their attention. Google is also adding more privacy-focused sharing settings and app permissions and some improvements for folding phones, including a two-way translation feature that looks really cool and, ah, oh, crap, that last one is Pixel exclusive. All right, so for the dozens of people who bought the Pixel Fold, you get to use that, neat. Uh, Health Connect, though, is not Pixel exclusive and will keep your fitness data in a single location, allowing apps that support the feature to sync that information. So no more entering your weight into three different apps. I mean, one time's enough, right? At least assuming that the apps you use support the framework and that Google keeps it alive o or resurrects it later, kind of like their smartwatch ambitions. That's right, there's also the new Pixel Watch 2. The original Pixel Watch, hey, it was a great first re-efforting from Google into the wearable space, but it was hamstrung by truly awful battery life. Well, no more. Now Google claims that you can get 24 hours of notifications on your wrist with the always-on display active and even longer without. Thank you, Google. A timepiece should always tell me the time. It should never wait for me to ask the time. And it gets even better. If you're the kind of person who likes to be with their watch all day and all night, 
You can get a 12 hour charge in just 30 minutes before you go to bed so you can take advantage of sleep tracking. Also, Google is finally taking advantage of that Fitbit acquisition and bringing along some of their branding and expertise to make use of three new sensors. There's the improved heart rate sensor that promises 40% more accurate heart rate tracking. There's a skin temp sensor now, and the new CEDA measures the microscopic beads of sweat on your wrist to help determine your emotional state and stress level. Oh good, I really need Google knowing my emotional state. You seem stressed. Have you tried retail therapy from one of these brand partners? Ugh. Um, oh, also there's um, AI improvements like personalized coaching and fitness data analysis. Google didn't explain if this happens on device or on a distant server somewhere, but seeing the current state of Google's barred AI, I probably won't be taking health advice from my watch even when this feature launches sometime next year. Uh, speaking of Bard, what about Google Assistant with Bard? Really? <laughs> Your AI couldn't generate a better branding idea than Google Assistant with Bard? Awful branding aside, this really does seem like it's gonna be the first big upgrade to Google Assistant in years, allowing you to ask more complex questions and interact with it more naturally. Will it allow me to turn lights off in one room and on in another room with the same command though? Only time will tell. They showed off features like making grocery lists, which seems great on the surface, except uh, I, the thing is these convenient AI features only work when you can actually trust the output, which currently, I don't know about you guys, but I don't really feel like I can. And unless Google has made massive strides with Bard, I have some serious doubts. Though, if at least I can call Jake Tyvee without saying Jake Tivy, then I'll be really happy. Oh, actually coming back to trust for a second though, this is only sort of on topic, but I've got a feeling that more Googlers are watching this video than usual. Hi. Um, and I wanted to talk about Google's ongoing pattern of eroding trust in their ecosystem. This is not a new observation, but Google has this propensity for killing projects that are enjoyed by many of their users. Recently, they killed Google Podcasts, which is a fairly self-explanatory product, and Jamboard, a well-liked whiteboard software that's used in business and educational settings. And I know you can listen to podcasts and YouTube music now, and they are going to support Jamboard customers by helping them migrate to something else, but these kinds of changes affect people and sometimes it's just a minor personal inconvenience, but other times it's a significant amount of money or it's a major personal inconvenience. And while they seem to take a try to do the right thing approach to this stuff, like when they bought back Stadia hardware and issued an update to make the controllers work standalone, sometimes it's not a one-to-one -one replacement. Like when Google Play Music went away and YouTube Music showed up, with the same catalog of songs, but the inability to stream to my Sonos gear that I had spent thousands of dollars on and whose functionality still hasn't been restored because Google won't pay Sonos for using their patents. This kind of behavior makes both individuals and organizations think twice about relying on Google's products. And that isn't something that you can fix with money. Um, Google used to get away with this kind of reckless product murder because they were the constant disruptor. They were always creating exciting products that changed how people used the web and then giving them away for free. But in present year, with the web and mobile sectors maturing into places where people expect to get real work done, they suddenly expect continuity and ease of use. And I mean, sure, look at Apple. They do things like throw away their entire hardware ecosystem every 15 years or so. But then think about how relatively elegant the switch was from Intel to ARM. Apple understands the importance of a smooth customer experience, predictability. No one is worried that Apple's first party podcast app is just gonna disappear for some reason. And if it does, they can reasonably expect things to still work. I mean, even Microsoft does a better job of this. Like they have tools that enable intergenerational software compatibility and they mostly work pretty okayly. To be clear, I think that the seven year OS update commitment is an absolutely massive step in this direction. Not to mention a great step for better sustainability. It might even take some of the sting out of the $100 price hike. But for me to start saying Pixel in the same breath as iPhone, when I talk about product support and longevity, I gotta see them follow through on this promise. 
unlike what they did with Pixel Pass, Google's Pixel phone upgrade program that disappeared before anyone got to use it. Or, hey, remember unlimited Pixel photo uploads? Bye bye It's time for Google to stop doing this kind of stuff and to be boringly reliable. Just like this boringly reliable segue to our sponsor. Circuit specialists. They know the STEM community needs electronic components and tools like plants need electrolytes. So they offer everything your nerdy brain could dream of. We're talking soldering stations, oscilloscopes, resistors, capacitors, remodulators, unaccelerators, and other things that I didn't just make up. With their expertise in tech component sourcing, circuit specialists give customers access to tools and parts that are often hard to find or too expensive. Their commitment to quality ensures that you receive reliable and high performance products suited for your needs. So let circuit specialists help you upgrade your electronics toolkit. Check them out at the link below and use code LMG for 10% off. If you guys enjoyed this video, maybe go check out the other side in our coverage of Apple's new iPhone 15 and 15 Pro, Pro Max, Pro Max Ultra, whatever, all the iPhones.